recording this. Um, it'll be structured like last quarter where it'll be set up as a quiz, kind of. You'll click on it like a quiz, hit start quiz, and that'll start a two hour timer. Um, and then you have, but the, the actual test will just be one PDF. So if you lose connection during the quiz, it's not a big deal. Um, you still have the PDF. And if you can't get it submitted um, by, by the timeline, email it to me. So connection issues shouldn't be an issue. I don't want anybody to be stressed out about connection issues. Um, I want you to be stressed out about the test. No, not really, but I know you will be stressed. I don't want to add to that. You guys will already be stressed enough about the test material. Um, so just remember, if you don't get it in under the timeline, email it to me as quickly as you can. Um, and when you save it, don't keep working on it. Because when you send it to me, I can see the timestamp when you stopped working on it. And as long as that's within two hours from when you started, then I then that's full credit. Even if it takes you until you know six hours later to get it sent to me, as long as you have it saved with a timestamp um, within those two hours. And so just so if it's a Word document you're working on, when you hit save, it's it keeps a record of when that save occurred. And I can see that when you submit that. So just make sure you're done at two hours and get that file saved and to me as soon as you can. Um, also worth noting, I, never, I haven't explicitly said this when it comes to the timed tests, um, partly because I didn't think Chegg was fast enough to get back to you within the timeline on timed tests, but apparently it needs to be said you can't use Chegg for these. They're open book, open note, um, but you can't just post a question, let somebody answer it for you, and then turn that in. Um, it's come to that point where I need to say that because I keep finding my test questions showing up on Chegg. Um, and you guys should all know that anything that shows up on Chegg, if I make a request of Chegg as the person who wrote the test, they give me all of your account information, including your email and all that stuff. Um, so nobody in this class would do that for an OCAM test. Um, but just so you know, Chegg cooperates with the, with the teachers and everything pretty well. And so you're just going to find yourself in a situation where you're going to wind up failing and having to repeat if you do something like that. So don't do that. Open book, open note. I'm already giving you everything you need. I'll show you, I'll give you more information in class today about the structure of the test. Um, and we will go from there. So you'll have some just make sure you have two hours set aside to take the test. It's going to be due on Sunday night, just like the quizzes. So allow for two hours to take the test sometime between Thursday morning and Sunday at midnight. Right? Seem reasonable? We can go over this. We'll go over the structure of the test in the exam review in lab today, too. So if you come up with any questions, um, feel free to ask then. Um, does anybody have anything right now they want to ask about? Sean, I got one real quick. Okay, RJ. Uh, so seven, you said was sub. It was an elimination, substitution, something like that. Sub substitution and elimination was seven. So that was last quarter. And that's just as far as that goes. Are we going to be tested on that whole mechanism again, or is it kind of like we no. have to understand how that pertains into eight, nine, and that kind of deal? Right. I just I have that one memorized. I know that's my my uh, landmark in the textbook because I know that that's chapter seven. So that's how I could count forward to get to the right chapter numbers. That's all. All right. Let's go ahead and move forward. Um, you guys asked lots of good questions, not specifically about the material we're covering, which tells me we're going at about the right pace because you guys are maybe even a little slow. Um, when almost all the questions are, wait a second, I don't understand this. I know I'm going too fast, but that's not the case. Um, so it tells me we're going at about the right pace. Pace. So I get to answer some fun questions since we don't have that much to cover today. Um, how does shampoo work in relation to organic chemistry? What's the role of sodium lauryl sulfate? Um, sodium lauryl sulfate is 
this molecule right here. And so laurel is just the common name for, I believe it's decil. I think it's 10 carbons long, if you count. Yeah, uh, maybe 12. Um, so that'd be sodium dodecyl sulfate. Um, all it is is it just works like like soap. It's or it looks like a works like a phospholipid in a cell. Phospholipid bilayers form in cells because you have one section of the molecule that's polar and charged that will interact with water, and the other part of the molecule that doesn't, that's nonpolar. And so that's all most soaps and detergents, including sodium lauryl sulfate, do, is that they make oil and grease and waxes and dirt more soluble in water by basically binding them up in these, um, these materials are called amphophilic materials. Ampho means both or two, right? Um, so amphophilic means it's both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. And so all that's all the, that uh, things like sodium lauryl sulfate do and that sodium lauryl sulfate's used in, in shampoo because it's actually less effective and less harsh than just using straight up soap. Soap is an even stronger charges on the end here. Um, and it's it's um, better at dissolving all of those nonpolar stuff, all that nonpolar stuff. Um, so it's bad for your scalp. Soap's really not particularly good for your skin either because most of those oils are supposed to be there for the most part. Um, so it's not a great thing to do all the time um, because your your body is actually producing usually close to the right amount of oil and everything that you need to. Um, and so if you don't shampoo your hair, you actually need to use less external products and gels and stuff like that because your your hair's own natural grease um, protects it the way that those products normally would. Or not normally. The products are the abnormal thing because they've only been around for like 50 years, right? And for the first 250,000 years of human existence, just used, you know, the grease that was in your hair was supposed to be there. Um, somebody else asked about performance enhancing drugs, and that's sort of a fine line because per performance enhancing drugs um, is anything that makes you better at a specific sport, right? And so each sport has a governing body that determines what qualifies as a performance enhancing drug. And sometimes those are drugs that are prescribed by a physician um, for legitimate purpose. You know, the treatment for ADHD is to prescribe amphetamines, right? Well, guess what? Amphetamines make you a really good hockey goalie because they amp up everything from your motivation to train and your confidence and your reflexes. Um, so for a long time in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, amphetamine use was really, really common um, in both baseball and hockey for that reason. Because, you know, can you imagine being, being standing and getting a 99 mile an hour fastball and having to swing at it? it really helps when you're all jacked on amphetamines. Um, so, and that, so now that's classified as a performance enhancing drug, but people that actually have documented cases of ADHD can get exceptions from the MLB um, to take their Adderall. Um, and so it really is a, a fine line there. And there are some tests that are, that are actually will give a false positive um, and it's not really a false positive. It's just a positive for something that is allowed for things like a steroid cream that's, that's prescribed for a rash or a cortisone shot that's given to, you know, for ringworm or something like that, or poison oak can still set off, um, a PED test because it is a steroid, which means it has very similar molecular shape to anabolic steroids. Um, so part of it is, is documentation. You have to have the documentation if you're an athlete that, hey, I'm allowed to be taking this, here's what I'm taking. Um, and even then sometimes they'll say, okay, well, you're not allowed to play until that's all done, until you're through with that particular treatment. Um, um, so it's, it's not so much that, the, that the, it's left over from, from the materials that the pharmaceutical companies use to make the drugs, it's so, more that the drugs themselves can set off, a wide range of drugs can all set off a potential positive um, for something that's not necessarily banned or that you have a, a right to take. Um, I know in particular, the one, this is, this is a weird, weird example, but um, I know that the drug test that, that they use for um, 
or the urine test that they use to test for PCP gives false positives a lot. Um, and so, and it can be from anything from, you know, an essential oil or just your, something in your diet can, can wind up testing positive for PCP, um, which is not that widespread of a drug, right? So it's like, that's a weird one that would be, but that's because it's just close enough to similar when, when urine tests, especially are testing for drugs, they're not actually testing for the drugs themselves. They're usually testing for what your body turns the drugs into. Your body takes the drugs and processes them and turns them into something else. And then that gets flushed through your system. Um, and so, but it, your body has similar mechanisms for a lot of different foreign molecules to turn them all into something similar. So that's why you get a lot of false positives based on things like diet. Um, and so, and, and things that do stay in your body longer are generally the things, the fat soluble drugs in particular, things that are, um, that are smoked, um, are typically fat soluble, which means that they get dissolved into your fat cells and stay there a lot longer. Things that are taken orally tend to have a really short half-life in your body because they're water soluble. And that means that your body can flush them through faster usually. Um, but those are the ones that show up, you know, it's, it seems backwards that some of the most harmful drugs are the first ones that your body can get rid of. Um, you know, methamphetamine and heroin only show up in your urine test for a um, couple days, maybe a week. Um, but things like, like THC are still detectable three weeks. And sometimes in really extreme cases, you can wind up with something like THC being dissolved in your fat cells, and you can wind up with it showing up literally years later. If you lose weight and your body breaks down a bunch of those triglycerides in your fat cells, it can actually wind up releasing some of those THC metabolites, and you can test positive um, for literally years, a decade later sometimes. Um, and hair tests are interesting because I believe that there's a limit legally on how far back they can go. Um, I don't know if it's, I think it's a legal limit, not a, not a lab testing limit. So as far, they have to test things that are only with about, within about an inch of your scalp or your skin. Um, anything that's further, I believe they're not, it's either that, that it breaks down enough that they can't test it, but I think it's actually a legal limit that they're not allowed to test for things more than an inch of hair growth into your past. Um, and, but, and that's, it's sort of similar. And that's why you can't do a hair test for a lot of different drugs. You mostly can do hair tests for things that are fat soluble like weed um, because, it's, because it's fat soluble. It's also soluble in the keratin that your body makes and gets incorporated, some of those metabolites get incorporated into the keratin structure. Um, but that is somewhat regulated. And I, like I said, I can't remember off the top of my head whether that's a physical limitation or a legal limitation, but I think it's a legal limitation. So if they can go back 90 days, but everyone's hair grows at different rates, they just pick an average. Yeah, I believe that that's the case. They just assume that, um, you know, they pick some arbitrary length of hair and say that that's, um, that's th the distance that they're allowed to go back. Um, and I, I believe that 90 days sounds about right. Yeah, that would make sense. And it could be that other states are going to be different and they can go back further into your, into your hair history. Um, so, but, uh, you know, and there, there are also ways around that too, right? Certain, certain uh, vitamin supplements can, can almost double the rate of hair growth. Um, I think biotin, like, which is in a, a B complex vitamin. Um, if you take that religiously every day, that will almost double the rate that your hair grows. Um, folic acid is also is vitamin B12. Um, most of the B vitamins will speed up the metabolism processes of your, of your hair follicles. Um, so, you know, not that I'm saying that that's a guaranteed, hey, if you take a B vitamin supplement, you can have the time before you can pass a drug test. Don't take that as, as a challenge. Um, but uh, there, you know, there are a lot of other factors that go into this is, is all I'm saying. Um, 
food for astronauts. Um, this is this is a fun one because it's less about the chemistry and more. Of, um, I'm going to answer it in the context of rocket science. Um, every pound of cargo that you bring up to space dramatically increases the amount of energy you have to spend to get there. Um, there's a point of of um, it's an inflection point, basically, where if you add any more mass, it doesn't matter how big you make your rocket boosters, you can't get it to orbit without making more efficient rocket engines. Um, and so diets for astronauts, there's a lot of variables they consider, but the primary one is um, how do we do that as light as possible? It's less about not making a mess. That's, that's a secondary consideration, but if it weighs too much, you can't get it to orbit, period. So it's more about how do we make things as light as possible? And so that's why they freeze dry it and remove all of the water because water is dense compared to most nutrients. So they remove all the water from it. And one, that makes it so it doesn't go bad. Two, it typically makes it easier to eat in, in zero gravity, but most importantly, just makes it lighter. Um, and that's why they don't, they don't uh, bring up a lot of extra water. They don't vent water into space. Um, they recycle water on the International Space Station and then drink it again um, because all water, all urine is, is your body's way of getting rid of extra nitrogen. So if your body, if your diet is set so that you don't have a lot of extra nitrogen and amino acids in it, there's not that much in your urine besides water. So they just keep it, filter it and, and process it and then goes back into the holding tank to be drank again just because they can't afford to waste water. Um, and I think even back during Apollo, if, if you're old enough like me that you remember seeing Apollo um, 13 at a young age, there's the there's a scene where they release urine into space and it make. Um, I don't think even in Apollo 13, even that far back, I don't think they were actually doing that. Um, so low nitrogen diet means lots of, um, a vegetarian diet in a lot of a lot of ways, low amounts of amino acids and basically not eating a lot of excess anything. Um, um, the primary source of nitrogen in diet is amino acids, um, which are present in protein. So, so a low protein diet, they have to balance that out because a low protein diet is also not good for astronauts that are on the International Space Station for a whole year because it also leads to, to muscle loss and bone density loss. Um, so it's a balancing act of trying to make sure that the filtering the filtration systems can keep up with it that you're not taxing those um, and high high nitrate high nitrogen diets are also bad for your kidneys as well because that's the body's filtering system right the kidneys are what actually make all of the urea urea is just a, a high nitrogen molecule that your body can turn every amino acid in it can be turned into urea and that's basically your body's way of flushing all of that extra nitrogen out is make one molecule with three nitrogens on it. That's only five heavy atoms, but three of them are nitrogen. Um, so it's, it's basically minimizing excess amino acids, only eat as many amino acids as you have to, to maintain muscle, muscle mass. Um, but, and so it's, it's a lot of it is dietetics. It's, it's not the organic chemist and they, because they also do start more or less from natural products with the exception of Tang, which I don't even think they send up anymore. Um, and Tang was sent up ma mainly because it was, a, it was a vitamin drink that didn't go bad, that was a powder, like powdered Datorade. So it was basically met that criteria there. Um, and it was a, you know, a publicity stunt. Astronauts drink Tang, you should drink Tang too. Um, that stuff was, Stuff was really interesting tasting. I don't know how many of you guys have had Tang before. Mm. All right, last but not least, you got a question about napalm and burning styrofoam. Since we talked about burning styrofoam last time, I thought this was appropriate. Um, so gas is easy thing to burn, but but they add styrofoam to gasoline to make a mixture that's kind of like, it's not the exact same thing that that uh, military would use to make napalm, but it's something similar. It's a, it's a gel that can also burn. And it's basically, you're just making a, a, it's almost like making maple syrup by adding sugar to water. 
you're at, you add styrofoam to gasoline to the point where there's more styrofoam than gasoline and it kind of behaves like a gel instead of behaving like it's a liquid or and a solid. Um, the same way that syrup behaves differently than water and sugar put to, um, separately. Um, and so that's essentially what it does is it just makes it so you've got something that burns easily and for a long period of time that's also really easy to contain. The problem with just using something like gasoline is one, you get an explosion, but it's not a very contained and controlled situation because any all the gas vapors that evaporate all can all ignite and you wind up with everything and you wind up with it burning very, very quickly, which is not pleasant to be in, but is a lot easier to survive and for plants and, and buildings to survive. Um, you know, if you just throw a can of gasoline on them and light it, that'll burn and then it'll go away, especially if it's wet. Um, so what napalm does is it slows it down and makes it and puts it into a form that can be aerosolized or weaponized a lot easier and sort of put into a very controlled spray, um, which is, can then be lit on fire. And, and, um, so that, and that's one of the reasons why it's, it's so nasty is because it burns at close to the same temperature as gasoline burning, but it burns a lot slower and longer. So it, de it depletes more oxygen out of the air, um, more going to cause deeper burns, more likely to burn structures, um, all of those nasty things. Um, and so they don't exactly use not styrofoam, but something really, really close. So I went to, to undergrad in San Diego, um, and San Diego is a big Navy town. And one of my professors actually did some contracting work for, for one of the Navy bases that actually had, they store napalm in big tanks that looked like big propane tanks. Um, and you, it was an old tank and around some of the screw holes, there was some corrosion where it was, where it was leaking a little bit and it would grow these like ribbons of styrofoam. Um, it was, a, it was almost like a, like a fingernail growing, like when people's fingernails get really long and like curl in on themselves, it kind of looked like that, except made out of styrofoam. Um, and that was because as it was leaking, the gasoline was evaporating and the styrofoam was left behind. Just interesting side note. Last and I already said last but not least, but this one's actually about our, our course material. So we'll make sure we cover this one. Um, if you bring a solution to a boil while at room temperature by putting it under vacuum and then reducing the atmospheric pressure, could you have recrystallization happen under vacuum at room temperature for products that decompose at relatively low temps? Um, changing the atmospheric pressure is absolutely a good way to get things to boil. The problem is, is it doesn't really affect solubility because solubility of a solid is based on temperature because it's, it's related to, to the um, delta G of the reaction, right? So we actually need the temperature to increase in order for the solubility to increase. Um, so we do play around with atmospheric pressure and use vacuum pumps in lab in purification processes, but not for recrystallization typically. If you've got a product that's going to decompose um, at 100 Celsius or something like that, then you just need to make sure you're careful choosing your solvent to make sure that that solvent's boiling point is below where that product will decompose. So maybe you have to use ethanol instead of water to do a recrystallization. Um, or maybe you have to do your, you know, dissolve it at room temperature and then bring it, bring it all the way down to um, dry ice temperatures. Instead of going from, from 100 Celsius to zero Celsius, you can, you can mess with the solubility by dissolving it at 20 Celsius and then crystallizing it at negative 70 Celsius instead. You get almost as big of a swing, um, but that's a way to make sure that you, you can change the solubility without, chain, without getting to that point where your product's going to break down. Um, where we do play around with the, with the atmospheric temperature is actually we use vacuum distillation a lot of times to remove excess solvent without heating up our product again. So rather than boil off water by bringing it up to boiling and just letting it sit there till all the water's gone, um, you can boil off a solvent just by putting hooking it up to a vacuum pump. Um, and then so, sometimes like with dichloromethane, really common solvent, if you put it attached to a vacuum pump, 
um, you can actually get it to boil just by putting your hands on the on the flask. The body heat is enough to make it boil, um, which means that you're not going to break down your product as much, but you can still remove your solvent. Um, so we do play around with that in organic chemistry. It's just not in the context of recrystallization. All right. Any other random questions? We're now half an hour in here, and that's totally fine oh, because fine. today's lecture will go quick. Um, Sean, I had a question actually. Mm -hmm. um, just in regards to the um, to the midterm, and you were saying when we save it on Word, you can see the timestamp of when we saved it. Yes. Um, so is this going to be? Is this midterm? I mean, is this not going to require us to like? use a pencil and a piece of paper to write out reactions. So I was just using that as an example. I can also see a timestamp when you make a PDF or when you take pictures. Okay, like on CamScan? Yeah, CamScanner saves that information. Um, you, if, if you guys didn't know, there's, a, there's stuff called metadata that gets saved with, with, a, with image files um, and other stuff. Let me show you what I mean. Um, so like on, if I just look at, um, actually just even this view where it says date modified, like I can tell the last time I changed any of these files just by looking at date modified, it has a timestamp built into it. And so does, um, most, um, like here's some video files. So if I wanted to know when this file, particular file was edited, I can, I can just pull up its properties and created Tuesday, January 19th at this time, modified last time I accessed it. All of that stuff is encoded in the file itself. Um, and so that, that means that as long as you stop working when you're supposed to stop working, um, that I can, I can tell that you were following the rules. Um, it also means that you shouldn't try and pass off something you kept working on as being on time. Um, better to get, you know, to get a uh, zero out of 10 on question 10 than it is to get zero on the whole test. Um, I, I usually have some form, like I won't just arbitrarily give you a zero on the whole thing, but I, if I, if you try to pass it off as though you were on time and just couldn't get it sent to me, and then I see that you actually worked on it for four hours instead of two, um, I'm going to be a little bit more um, strict with how many points I take off. So better to to just get it saved and get it emailed to me. Um, I mean, not that I wouldn't give you a chance to explain yourself, but it doesn't help your situation when you when I have evidence like that, right? Um, so just don't mess with that get it done as best you can in the time limit and get it turned in. So Sean, as long as our save date or like timestamp is two hours from when we started the final or the midterm, that's what you're saying? Yeah, we and if you're worried that that's, that that's not going to be, you know, that I'm not going to be able to see that or you wanna prove that you can even attach something like a screenshot of you trying to submit with you where I can see your computer's clock or something like that too. You know, there. Just in general, I can usually tell, but if you're worried I'm, that I'm going to think you cheated when you didn't, you can always include a um, little extra piece of information. Like here's here's my file, it's done. Here's the last last thing I was working on here, with a picture of my computer's clock on it. Um, you know, just some way to get it time stamped, even if you can't get it in the email to me um, because of connection issues. The best thing to do is just get it emailed, even if. Canvas is shut down and it's not ac accepting the submissions um, because you missed it by 30 seconds. Just get it in the email to me right away because email has a timestamp, right? I know if you emailed it to me right away, that's an indisputable timestamp, right? Because you sent me that file that, and then you didn't have access to it again. Um, so that's the best thing to do. But I recognize with connection issues, and it's looking a little bit gray. I don't think we're supposed to get any weather anytime soon. But um, you know, if if you do have those connection issues, just just get it to me as quickly as you can. Get the file saved within your two hours, and you should be fine. 
And I'm not telling that to make you guys scared about it or extra nervous about it. Um, it's just don't, you know, don't assume that you can you can make the um, claim after where I it's really, really frustrating when students do things like, oh, I totally fi finished within the two hours, but I had connection issues and I can see that they were working on it for seven hours. Um, like, OK, come on, like that just makes me angry. So I'd much rather give you guys a zero on problem 10 out of 10 rather than have to deal with, well, how, how harsh do I have to be punishing them for cheating, right? That's a much better problem for everybody to have. All right. <clears throat> and any more questions about that, or if you have specific technology issues that you want to talk to me about, we can talk to, talk about that after or in uh, lab today too. Um, you guys pretty much all nailed the word problem from the quiz. You guys did did awesome on that. Um, the ones that I liked the best are the ones where you explained, okay, if with this formula there's only poss three possible isomers, and then went through said. Well, it can't be this isomer because we are going to get more than one bromination product. And it can't be this isomer because it would only give us one possible elimination product where you explain the logic there. But I think everybody got the structures right for A, B, C, and D. Did anybody have any part of this that was tricky, particularly tricky for you? And it's really the, the best way to solve. And I think that you guys are getting good at that when it comes to so some of the stuff we've done with lab with NMRs and IRs, if you have the formula and you can draw out all the possibilities and then start eliminating them is the best way to handle these sort of anytime you've got the molecular formula and you want to know what the real structure is. That should be your first go to. What are the valid structures I can draw? Um, and because that's going to take it from being something super open ended that seems like there's way too many possibilities and all of a sudden that gives you a concrete set of possibilities that you can look at. So good work on that. All right, let's. Let's talk about synthesis in a little bit more detail. Um, and this is just sort of formalizing some things we've talked about before. Um, and because because I remember I mentioned the first thing we started talking about, we didn't break this into two groups at first, because at first, when we first started adding these reactions, we had substitution and elimination, right? And then we had addition reactions. We didn't really have any reactions that did category two. All we had was functional group transformations at first, right? But these are really the, the best way to look at a synthesis problem is to say, okay, well, do I need to change the carbon skeleton? If you can start with the right carbon skeleton, then all you're looking at is reactions from, from the first category here, right? If all of your carbons, if, if your starting material has all the carbons in the right spot already, all you need to do is say, okay, well, I got to change this functional group from here to here. And that's going to take three steps to do that, to move an alkyl halide and then convert it into an OH group or something like that. All right. So the and the reactions that change the carbon skeleton give us a lot of flexibility with our starting material, but they're also fairly limited. We only have a few of them, right? Basically, at this point, you just have that you turning it into an acetylide ion and using that as a nucleophile or ozonolysis if we want to remove carbons. And I'll, re I'll recap those in a second too. Um, but remember, we don't, we have a lot of flexibility as to what products we can make from our starting material, but we only have a few tools to do it. So the trick is to learn those tools really well and how they can apply to a lot of different common patterns. Um, and that's going to make a lot of these synthesis problems really straightforward. So for right now, our functional group transformations, um, the most, the ones that we know how to do right now is we can, we can move a halogen around by doing things like have go through an elimination and then do another addition reaction. Allows us to control things like Markovnikov versus anti-Markovnikov. 
to change where we're re-adding our halogen, right? So we can move a halogen by doing that, by doing elimination then addition and controlling how we do it. Do we do the Zaitsev product or the Hoffman product? And then do we do the Markovnikov or the anti-Markovnikov? Those two variables allow us to move halogens pretty easily two or three carbons away from where they started. Um, in the same way, we can change the position of a pi bond, right? If you, if you start with a pi bond in one spot and you do an addition reaction and then another elimination. So if we were looking at the, and we'll, we'll do this in more detail in a second, changing the position of a halogen might look like elimination then addition. So we eliminate the halogen to create a pi bond, and then we add the halogen back on in a different spot. Changing the position of a pi bond is just going to be the opposite. If we do an addition, then another elimination, that allows us to move a pi bond around. And then our last category here that we have for right now is we can we can convert between single, double, triple bonds. If we have a triple bond, we can do how or a hydrogenation to make it a double bond or a single bond. If we have a, a single bond, um, we can convert that into a double bond by doing an elimination reaction. We might just have to halogenate it first using the free radical reactions. But that's one of the things that's powerful about the free radical reactions is that it gives us a way to take an alkane that has no functional groups and add a functional group and give us basically a handle that we can hold on to, right? And that gives us a way that, okay, once we have a halogen on this molecule, then we can turn it into a pi bond. We can move the halogen around. We can turn it into an alkyne. We can turn it into an OH group, right? So these are, we only have these three tools right now, but there, we have variations on them that give us a lot of flexibility. And these three tools are almost everything we're gonna need for right now. Well, they are everything we're gonna need for right now because I'm not gonna ask you any questions that you can't answer yet. Um, we're gonna keep adding to these, but these are pretty powerful in and of themselves. All right, so here's some, some um, going through a two-step process to do things like move the halogen. If we can control the reactants, the reagents, to choose whether we make the Zaitsev or the Hoffman elimination product, and then we can take the elimination product and control whether we add it our bromine in a Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov position. Just, and that's that was one of our free radical mechanisms, right? So that allows us to just, in two steps, move a bromine over. And if we chose, if we wanted to move the bromine the other direction, we would just make the Hoffman product and do the anti-Markovnikov product. So the one that's shown, bromine going from a secondary carbon to a tertiary carbon, we would make that this first step is making the Zaitsev product, the more substituted alkene. And we follow it up with the Markovnikov addition, just HBr and we get our bromine on the more substituted carbon. If we did the Hoffman product for our elimination, we'd put the pi bond over here. And then if we did the anti-Markovnikov bromination, we would put the bromine on carbon one over on the left. Right, so that's why we make a big deal of state set versus Hoffman and Markovnikov versus antis, because that's how we can control what we're making. Otherwise, you're not driving a car, you're riding a, you're riding a roller coaster. You're going where the track goes. But if we have the ability to choose where to turn, then we can go wherever we want. Um, so here's just a, the, this chapter, chapter 11 has, a, has some reaction summaries that look very complicated, but all they're doing is describing different ways of moving a halogen, for instance. Um, and instead of just saying Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov, or Zaitsev-Hoffman, 
it actually has the reactants in there. So bromine plus a small strong base gives you the Zaitsev product. If you took that and then went the anti-Markovnikov route, you'd go back to where you started. If you take bromine, this molecule, and give it the sterically hindered base, TBUOK, we get the Hoffman product, which then we can go through anti-Markovnikov to get bromine over here. So this is just showing exactly what we just what I described verbally. And this you can think about this as a subway map. You can follow these arrows to interconvert from one mechanism or from one of these steps to the other. We can actually go backward from this other one too, right? Just a normal elimination from this product on the right hand side would would make go back here, right? And so we would need to, where's my snipping tool? We could just as easily. Uh, do we need it to be? We don't even need that. We would just want to go through a regular elimination. And bear with me. It seems cumbersome, but trust me, this is about the fastest way to actually make some of these reactions is to just snip stuff that's already been made and clip it around into different orientations. That makes sense too, right? If you start from the tertiary bromide and you just expose it to a strong base, you'll go back to making the elimination product. This molecule will go through elimination just as well, right? So we can actually convert back and forth between any of these just by controlling, are we doing elimination or are we doing addition? We can do the same thing down here too, right? All right, so you get on the westbound train, Start if you start a molecule on the top right and you get on the westbound train, you make this molecule. From here, you could make this molecule and then you could go the other direction. So we can actually continue this in different, we can keep going in any of these different processes. Um, and that will that will allow us to basically move the bromine anywhere we want on this molecule. In fact, if we wanted to put the bromine on one of the methyl groups on the right-hand side, we could just do this again. From the top right molecule, we could do another elimination reaction with a sterically hindered base is going to put the pi bond to one of the methyls over here. And then we could do the anti-Markovnikov bromine. So we can literally put the bromine on any one of the carbons we want in four or five reaction steps. Alcohols are a little bit harder to move around um, because they have stronger bonds. They're not as good at le as being leaving groups, right? So it's harder to get alcohols to go through an elimination reaction, OHs. Um, but they actually have a very similar process. We just have a reaction where we convert the oxygen in, or the OH into something that's a better leaving group, um, which they usually refer to as OTS. TS stands for uh, tosylate, which is basically you attach a, a sulfur with a benzene attached to it and turns it into a big, um, a good leaving group. So a tosylate group looks like this. It's toluene with a sulfate attached opposite of the um, methyl group. And, all, and then you attach this oxygen in a single bond to something else. So if we wanted to say, um, let's say two tosyl, um, two tosyl ethanol, see what, if that'll give us something. Ooh, 
that doesn't look very good. Um, there we go. So two tosyl alcohol uh, ethanol on carbon two, you would just attach that so that sulfur group in this case, we usually write as OTS rather than just tosyl. And that, but all that that's really doing, that OTS just gives us something we can convert an alcohol to this tosyl group. Um, and what that does is it makes it a better leaving group so that then we can go through an elimination and then we can go through hydration. So it allows us to do the same logic as moving a halogen around with an alcohol, with an OH group. Um, if you already had a bromine here instead of an OH, you wouldn't need to mess with that, right? If you can just put the bromine where you want it first and then have it go through a substitution, that's even easier. But if you're starting from a material that has an OH instead of a bromine, then this is how you would move it around. You convert the oxygen into a better leaving group and then you convert, and then you can go through elimination in addition, just like we were talking about. Um, and the way that reaction looks, so this is a very similar diagram to the one we just looked at. It's a, it's our subway map between these different functional groups, how to move things around. This step one that's shown up at the top. That's how you describe that's the, the reaction for converting an OH to an OTS group. And I'm not going to make you write out what the structure is of the TS section. We just use TS as a, as a shorthand, the same way we use ET to represent an ethyl group. We just put TS, and all you guys need to know for right now is that that means it's something that can go through an elimination reaction easily. And once you do go through an elimination reaction, now we've got a pi bond and we can treat our pi bond the way we normally would want to change it. If we want to go Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov, we've got our acid catalyzed hydration or our hydroboration. All right, so it's really, it just adds one extra step to our elimination reactions. And so all of these should look familiar to you, right? We've seen all these reactions before. Got our acid catalyzed hydration. We have our oxymercuration, demercuration. So Markovnikov, but no rearrangement happening. We've got our anti-Markovnikov reaction. This looks weird, but that's still just an, a Hoffman elimination. And this looks weird, but it's still just a Zaitsev elimination. We just need the first step in order for that OH to be a good leaving group. What's the next one? Um, that's as good a place as any to take a, take a quick break. We're going to go through the other ones, and then we're going to do some practice with this. And if we don't get through all of the practice, then we'll finish up at the beginning of lab. Um, so let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at nine and, uh, and we'll keep working on this.
How's your weekend, Sean? I was pretty good. Got to watch that blowout of the Super Bowl, which was too bad. Yeah, I watched the first half and then kind of lost interest. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's about how it went. Just you know, I uh, I have a special special place in my heart for the Chiefs. They've taken the Niners former quarterbacks a few times and I like them for that you know, Montana finished his career with the Chiefs and and uh you know Garcia went to or no Adams Alex Smith actually and Garcia too um all went to the Chiefs after the Niners um plus they beat the Niners was it last year or the year before so oh yeah so uh, I was hoping the Chiefs were going to put up a better fight than that but you know it's Tom Brady what can you do <laughs> and I, I haven't I haven't even followed football it's crazy I haven't followed football in like 10 years and yet I still know the best player in, in the NFL because it's the same guy <laughs> but yeah I never really got too much into the sports football was fun fantasy football was fun for a bit um but uh, I don't. I'm not a huge fan of the NFL because the way they handle that concussion research and everything. Yeah, um, it's football is just not very good for your body. So, but and I like baseball better myself at this point. Baseball, so you can be as over analytic as you want, or you can just be at the game and eating a hot dog and not paying much attention to anything but the score. You can be anywhere in between. So. Yeah heard about a study where they're using psilocybin for cte treatments it's kind of interesting that wouldn't surprise me a lot of a lot of psychs are you know are under researched because of of how villainized they were and how um i don't want to i don't want to blame the hippies but the hippies made it made it uh, easy for the establishment to paint all psychedelics with a really broad brush and just say no um but uh, if that hadn't happened, I think that we would be, you know, 20, 30 years further along on some of this, this neurology research. Yeah, I'm um, just happy to see that it's kind of trending in that direction now. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Um, psilocybin is, is a, they're using that as a good place to start to, sh because it's one, it's easy to make, you know, you don't need to go through a complicated synthesis. Um, it's easy to grow and then purify from, from mushrooms. And then it's really pretty easy and then, so there, there's a lot of stuff that's been going on, um, treating treating terminal illness, depression due to terminal illness with psilocybin, um, CTE. They're looking at using psychedelics for things like PTSD as well, yeah. um, because a lot of PTSD is linked to a decrease in empathy and a sort of siloing oneself off from the surrounding world as a protection mechanism. Right. So doing things like like dissolving dissolving the id um and uh you know ego death sort of trips can be um they're looking at that as a way to treat ptsd that way and they're actually looking at using mdma for that as well a lot of that class that called um uh empathogens they're yeah, sorry, sort of in that sorry. that in between between a classic hallucinogen and and a stimulant where they increase your empathy yeah um a lot of different a, synthetic a, versions of that stuff. Yeah, they, they do pretty pretty interesting research is happening, and it's it's going to be there's that's going to be the next wave of pharmaceuticals, right? Pharmaceutical companies aren't going to let something like the the DEA stop them from doing research into what the next big drug is going to be, the right. next Prozac, and the next the next Vi Viagra and the next Valium is what they're always looking for, right? Um, and so. Now that they've sort of started the ball rolling of doing research down into the psychedelic region, that's going to be where the next big innovation happens from in uh, psychiatric meds. Um, yeah, and so they're exciting. It is. It is. And and this is one of one of the one of the cases where capitalism is actually providing a push in the right direction. Um, although it's going to be you know, monetized and controlled by the pharmaceutical companies in a way that it doesn't need to be. Um, okay. But that's a whole different discussion. But uh, yeah. it's, yeah, it's <laughs> interesting that the research is at least happening and not being totally shut down like it used to be. 
Yeah, I saw one where they're going to do a combination of MDMA and LSD as part of their treatment. I thought that was an interesting oh. choice. A little little hippie flip. Yeah, uh, a little hippie flip. <laughs> um, yeah, that's uh, and I'm sure that they have the reasons for doing it. It's, but you can contrast the way that the pharmaceutical companies are moving towards stuff that they would have considered off limits. Um, because there hasn't really been any big breakthroughs in the last other uh, in the last ten years or so, um, I actually have a I have a relative who works for a company whose job is to educate psychology psychiatrists on what medications are appropriate to prescribe for various things. Oh, that's and interesting. Ten, yeah, he said ten years ago he was telling me that they hadn't they don't were no new drugs basically for five years before that. Um, the only things that they were marketing were different combinations of the drugs they already had. Mm. And so I think that they, just like oil companies are realizing they're reaching the end of the life cycle for petroleum um, cars and are looking, and now they're starting to look into alternative energy. The pharmaceutical company is doing the same thing. They've reached the end of the life cycle of the common drugs they can prescribe now. So now they're looking for what's the next thing that we can patent and you know make buckets of money for the next 10 years um, before it becomes generic. Yeah, just uh, just a matter of, of fighting against the law. There's a lot of different things that they could you know use in that application, right? Right. When when you're a when you're a trillion dollar industry, um, fighting against the law gets a lot easier. Um, <laughs> So there's there's a and that's one of the things that's pushing for declassification of things like like marijuana from schedule one and um, psychedelics from schedule one is some of this research that, that's coming from overseas but it's also pressure from the pharmaceutical industry it says okay no this actually is helpful uh, it just helps when you have billions of dollars to throw at washington to get them to listen to you um, they're never going to yeah. listen to timothy leary trying to convince you not them to declassify lsd right no I wonder how uh, the decriminalization of stuff in Oregon would potentially affect some of the scientific research out there. So it, sh it probably won't affect Oregon very much because there's a difference between legalization and decriminalization, right? All this decriminalization is not saying it's illegal to have these drugs, just that you're not going to be prosecuted. So you still okay. can't buy them in Oregon legally. But if you possess it, basically it's getting rid of possession charges. Oh, yeah. I was hoping that would open the door for more research, but I guess, you know, you can't go to Sigma Aldrich and buy whatever you want. <laughs> um, you, you might be surprised, actually. You can't. Sigma is actually very, very regu regulated by the DEA. And if you're getting anything that's either a precursor or that is a, a Schedule 1 drug, you have to have clearance from the, from the DEA ahead of time. And Schedule 1 literally means there is no legitimate purpose for having this drug so if it's a schedule one drug basically it eliminates all research on it because it's basically saying you can't buy it from sigma you can't buy it anywhere you can't even do research on it um because it's it's just has no valid medical or research purposes um so that's why all of the research on all those schedule one drugs basically there was no research until things started getting declassified or removed from schedule one um, except overseas. And that's why there's almost no research on cannabis. Um, because for whatever reason, thanks Richard Nixon, it's a schedule one drug. <laughs> Actually, I think that was FDR. It, it, it goes all the way back to prohibition is when they first started the DEA and, and classifying drugs as schedule one was all the way back to prohibition. But when they repealed prohibition, when it came to alcohol, they left all the drugs there and left them as illegal. Before that, there was no regulation. Um, yeah, it's something to do with the paper companies and hemp and stuff like that. Is that what you're saying with Hearst? Emily or whoever put that up there? Sorry, what? What do you mean by Hearst? Well, um, from my understanding, at least like where I'm from, because that's like where Hearst Castle is and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like said that uh, marijuana stayed illegal because he really pushed through that through yellow journalism because he owned most of the magazines and also he owned most of the timber yards that produced most of the paper for the United States and hemp paper was kind of a big thing at that point in time. So he wanted to keep marijuana illegal to help keep his monopoly on things that he had already purchased and owned. Yeah, I think they made a breakthrough in the way that they processed hemp, which was going to explode the hemp industry. And then I think Hearst kind of freaked out and did a political... I think to make like a field of like, um, I think it's like Romulus marijuana makes like 
more paper for cheap it's like cheaper like less labor and way less water too so it's just it's overall better but he owned so many different timber yards and fields and stuff that he of like uh trees and crops that he didn't want it to be switched over propaganda yeah and it and it uh it coincided with a um a push to there to villainize drugs in a lot of ways and so it was basically like well the you know Hearst and the paper companies were pushing for one reason at the same time that the Vietnam War was heating up and they needed something that they could really point to and say well this is a problem here um you know you know basically to make the counterculture movement illegal in a lot of ways um and that so that all kind of coincided in the 60s and and late 50s um it's it's fascinating time in history if you look at some of the if you look at some of the legal and political things that were happening especially as it applies to to drugs and some it's it's the equivalent what Hearst did was the equivalent of bp buying up alternative energy sources and yeah. then keeping them sequestered away and not bringing them out until the oil is all gone what actually even goes back further than that because i just looked it up in reefer madness like the propaganda movie against marijuana saying it'll turn right. into like some kind of sex crazed deviant um it goes back to like 1936 yeah and that's yeah exactly when they were and that's they were getting ready to repeal prohibition for alcohol at that point but they needed to separate the other drugs from that because it, enough people need wanted alcohol to be deep class but rather than just repeal all of prohibition they kept the prohibition on the drugs and that was a big push from from the um from the establishment at that point to basically say a, you know, to keep all of those other deviants separate from mainstream America and villainize them um, See, was served a, a very big prop um, purpose talk back then. In my pharmacology class. What's that? You don't talk about any of this in my pharmacology class. Yeah, that happens. Um, you have to take a a, a history a, or a um, there are history of pharmacology and you know ethnobotany classes and stuff like that at bigger schools that you'd be able to take, but we don't have those, so I get to talk about it instead. All right, let's go back here and uh, and talk about the processes for moving pi bonds. And again, they're going to look very similar. The order is just going to be flipped on most of these, right? Rather than elimination then addition, we're going to go with addition then elimination. But the same thing, controlling Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov, controlling um, Zaitsev Hoffman um, is going to be what allows us to basically put that pi bond anywhere we want. Basically, with this molecule, the only place we couldn't put the pi bond without a lot of, with a relatively high yield, is exactly opposite from where it is right now. Because we could put, we could move the pi bond over one spot just by um, by going through the process that's that's described here: addition, regular um, Markovnikov addition, and then doing a Hoffman elimination. Um, but if you went the other way, if you did the anti-Markovnikov addition followed by the the Hoffman elimination, we could wind up putting a pi bond down here, right? And then if we took that, the problem is now we've got two secondary carbons. And so if we tried to do an a anti-Markovnikov addition, we're going to get a 50-50 of both products. So that's going to cut our yield in half. If we are limited to only 50% of it's going to put the, the pi bond over on the other side. Um, but we could do it. It's just going to not have great yields. And we could do it again and get 50% yields on, uh, on that 50%. So we can make the product that has the pi bond all the way opposite from where it started. It's just going to be pretty small yield, 25% yield, 10% yield, somewhere in there. Um, but there are, and so Usually, if that's the case, if we really, really wanted that pi bond over there, if we needed it for some pharmaceutical purpose or some some plastic industry purpose, what we would do is we'd find a different starting material. Um, and that's why things like ethnobotany and trying to find new precursors, novel precursors, is really big field still as well. Because if you can find something closer to where you want to want to be at the end, 
um, then a lot of times that's going to increase your yield a lot. Um, to go back to the drug discovery discussion, um, that's, you know, and I've, uh, I've thrown his name out there before. Alexander Shulgin was famous, is famous for basically figuring out, well, I'm going to make this different version of a, of a phenyl ethyl amine and see what that does to the human brain. And I'm going to stick a, a methoxy group over here and see what that does to the human brain. Um, but he started from natural products. He had, there's actually a class of, of medications called the essential, he calls the um, essential amphetamines. He was testing it literally by just having grad students volunteer to take it. Um, they would do a tiny amount first to make sure it wasn't going to make them super sick, like way below a threshold dose. Um, and then they would just like, okay, who's, who's up for this one? And, and it eventually led to him getting his DEA license revoked. Um, but this is UC Santa Barbara in the 70s. So there was, there was a lot of, of stuff like that going on. Um, so, but, uh, you know, but there was this whole class of compounds. He, he classified them as, he called them essential amphetamines. It's basically amphetamines that have amphetamine-like prop properties that you could get by just adding an amine group to an essential oil. You take an essential oil and you put an amine group in the right spot and you get these this class of things and it's so he was starting from if you start from sassafras oil you get mdma if you start from um nutmeg oil you get dma if you start from clove oil you get this other comp dom i think he called it um you got this whole range of amphetamines but they all all you had to do was the same synthesis step if you could start from the right precursor so finding the right precursor is just as important in a lot of these medicinal and industrial processes as knowing the synthesis steps as well. Um, and that's why the DEA outlaws precursors or controls precursors, right? It's actually illegal to buy sassafras oil um, or even sassafras arc because it's pretty easy to turn that into MDMA. Um, it's the same reason that it's illegal to buy, you know, Sudafed by the truckload, because it's really easy to turn that into methamphetamine. Um, all right, so this is just another map that looks a lot like the other one. That's just a good way of organizing your thoughts on, okay, if I want to move my pi bond, from the most substituted to the least substituted. You do an addition, regular acid catalyzed addition, then you do a sterically hindered base. You want to move the pipe on the other direction, you do a regular, you do an anti Markovnikov addition, followed by a sterically hindered base. Right, so that gives us three different places for us to put our pi bond, which gives us a lot of flexibility. And then from there, we can choose whatever we want to do an addition reaction. We, will, we can then take these and do um, any of our hydration reactions as well, right? So we don't, we're not limited to just using the halogens. Halogens are just convenient because they're such good leaving groups and they also add really predictably. Um, if we want to change the order of a pi bond, if we want to go from an alkyne to an alkene or an alkene to an alkane or the other direction, we have a, a list of reactions as well. Um, if, we, if we want to go from an alkene to an alkane, we just hydrogenate it, hydrogen, gas, and platinum. If we want to go from an al alkyne all the way to an alkene, sorry, an alkyne all the way to an alkane, we do the same thing. H2 with platinum, right? That's going to fully hydrogenate it and turn it into the alkane. If we want to go part way, we can either use the, the Lindler's catalyst, that poison catalyst, if we want the cis product, or we can go with the dissolving metal re, um, reduction if we want the trans product. We have two options for partially hydrogenating an alkyne. And we also have a way we can go from an alkene to an alkyne. 
we have to dibrolinate it first and then go through that excess sodium amide so we can convert this to a dibromide with the first step and then go through that double elimination. Um, but we have a set of reactions that can do that. This one is the one that we just added. That's our free radical reactions. Because if your starting material is an alkane, we can't do anything with it. If your starting material is an alkane, the only way to give yourself a place to start doing reactions is to brominate it. And so you have to use free radical bromination for this to work. Um, and bromination is, is more specific than the chlorination. You could use chlorine, but then you're going to get a mixture of products, right? Which if you want the less, less favored product, you might consider doing that. Um, seeing whether or not that will give you better yields than adding a bromine in a predictable spot and then moving the bromine. Um, but realistically, bromine, because it's more selective, is a better choice usually. And then you can go through an elimination if you wanted to go from an alkane to an alkene. There is no shortcut, though, when it comes to you can't go all the way from an alkane to an alkyne because you need two bromines on there before you can do the double elimination, right? So you have to go from an alkane to an alkene, then you can do a double, addi double addition, add the two bromines to it, and then do the double elimination. And so we're limited a little bit on how quickly we can get from place to place, how many steps it's going to take but we do have a ton of different possibilities. And that's one of the reasons why I had you guys work on those different reaction series, because you can see some of these patterns show up all over the place, right? This, this one is, um, that's three steps, but it, the net result of that is double brominate, then double eliminate, and the water is just to proton, protonate at the end to make sure that you don't have that acetylide at the end. But that's three steps that are, the net result is always going to be alkene goes to alkyne. And I put this in here as a quote just because this is a really important point. And I'm say it one more time. If you're starting as an alkane, you don't have anything to work with. There are no functional groups to work with. So if you're starting with an alkane, your first step is almost always going to be radical halogenation because you need to pull a hydrogen off and replace it with a bromine so you have something to work with. It's the, there's a lot of different DIY analogies. I'm sure I could come up with the one that's, that's, uh, um, making sense to me is before you can work on on engine of car you've got to open the hood otherwise you can't get to all the stuff you can't get a hand on all the stuff that might be going wrong right so the first step in that case is to give yourself something that you can look at give yourself a functional group you can work with otherwise the only two the only react other reaction that alkanes go through is combustion which is not super helpful in a synthesis, right? The only other thing we use alkanes for is just straight up burning them. Or we go through radical halogenation and then we have something we can do, we can work with. All right, so let's do a practice. We want to go through this transformation. How would we go about it? I'll give you guys a few minutes to work on that.
All right. I think looks like most of you guys are at least on your way here. This has got to be a couple steps because before we can add the bromine to the right spot, we, could, we know how we could add the bromine to the less substituted carbon, right? That's an anti-Markovnikov addition. But that means that in, we would need to have this molecule first. So we can get to our final product by just doing HBr with peroxide. We know what, how we could get that step. So then it's a question of, okay, well, how do we move the pi bond over one spot? Moving the pi bond over one spot means we just have to do it and we're gonna do an addition and then follow that by an elimination. We're just gonna control which version of the addition we're going to see. So in order to get the elimination product, that's the anti or the Hoffman product, we needed TBU okay, right? We need the sterically hindered base. And that would allow us to go from having a bromine on the second carbon to the less substituted alkene. So then it's a matter of, okay, well then how do we, from our starting material, that means we need to do the anti-Markovnikov or the, sorry, the Hoffman addition again. If we do the Hoffman addition from where we start, we put the bromine on the less substituted carbon, right? And then we can do a sterically hindered elimination and then the Hoffman addition again. Sorry, I'm mixing up those. Those would be, be the anti-Markovnikov additions, the Hoffman elimination. So we're gonna need to do two anti-Markovnikov additions with a Hoffman elimination in the middle. All right, so it gets a little repetitive sometimes. But that's totally valid way to do it. If you want to do, if you want to keep moving the bromine to the less substituted position, you just keep doing um, anti-Markovnikov and Hoffman reactions. If we wanted to go the other way, if we wanted to move the bromine towards the more substituted carbon, we would we could do multiple Markovnikov additions with Zaitsev eliminations in between. And we could probably even, we could write this all out as one, as one reaction arrow as HBr comma R-O-O-R to TBU. Okay, three HBr. R, O, O, R. Each of those is gonna have its own distinct intermediate that we have drawn out, but that would be the, the synthesis pathway. Would, you could just write it like that. It's hard to get to this unless you you get really good at doing this and seeing these synthesis pathways. It's hard to get to these three steps without drawing out the intermediates. And it's frequently helpful to go backwards. I don't necessarily, Think it's helpful necessarily to use those retro synthesis arrows. I wanted you guys to see them, um, but I think it's. I find it easier usually to just work from right to left, rather than use those retro synthesis arrows that mean you're going backwards. Keep your arrows meaning the same thing, and just work 
in the opposite direction of normal. Um, so, I mean, ideally it would be a little bit neater than what I've drawn here, but this is a perfectly valid answer to this problem. If it's proposed a valid synthesis, show your starting material, show some intermediates and, and including the reactants. That's the other part of this. It's not just what are the intermediates, it's what are the reactants that you need to get there. Then then end at your final product. All right, so that's this is kind of why I find I find that this chapter we can go through pretty quickly because we've seen similar problems before. Right. There's no other than that converting an alcohol to an OTS, there's really no new reactions either. It's just here's how you can leverage the reactions you already have. So last topic here is how do we change the number of carbons. This is the second category of those reactions. We have some good tools now for how do we move pi bonds? How do we move halides? How do we move oxygens? If we wanna move carbons though, there's really two categories. There's cleavage reactions or there's, there's addition reactions where you have carbon acting as a nucleophile. Cleavage reactions mean that you're cleaving things. Cleave, this is cleave in the classic sense of you're cutting something in half, like a meat cleaver. A cleavage reaction just means we had a cup two versions of ozonolysis, but ozonolysis was our only cleavage reaction, right? Find a carbon carbon pi bond, you chop it in half, and you add an oxygen on both sides. You replace both of the carbon carbon bonds with carbon oxygen bonds. If you do this with a alkyne instead, you don't get a carbonyl, you get a carboxylic acid, but the process is identical, right? So this gives us a way we can control how many carbons we have as well. If we want to add carbons, and I think that there's some text behind there that is not showing up. There we go. Um, if we want to add carbons, we go through what's called alkylation. And I overcorrected. That's a Y. Alkylation means we're adding an alkyl group. And an alkyl group is just, it's like saying an aliphatic group. This is a way we can add carbons. And the only way we have of doing that at this point is you turn, you need to deprotonate an alkyne, and then it can be used as a nucleophile. But in order to do that, you have to have a good leaving group for it to attack that carbon, right? So even this might still require you to, depending on what materials you're allowed to start with, you might have to start with propane and then brominate the propane in order to do this. So you can actually have synthesis problems where you have to approach it from two sides. You have to make both precursors in order to get ready to do this alkylation and put them together into one. Um, but in theory, we could start with isopropyl alcohol and we could convert isopropyl alcohol into this one bromo propane, which then could be attacked by this alkyl group. Right? And that would be its own sort of separate synthesis to go from isopropyl alcohol to one bromo propane. But it's still steps we've talked about. Convert your alcohol to OTS, do an elimination, do an anti-Markovnikov HBR addition gets you to having this so you can start from relatively common and cheap materials do a synthesis to make one of your pieces do a synthesis to make your other piece and then stick them together to make your final product right and so these are basically going to work very almost exactly opposite to a cleavage reaction you take the pieces and you stick them together you just have to know where you're attaching them and it's always going to be where the leaving group is So again, this is, I find this approach to be easier to write your synthesis pathways out like this, 
even if you don't know how many steps there, to start with your end product and work backwards one step at a time. Okay, well, how can I make this? Well, I need to start with something that has two bromines on the end. Or so if we're starting from something, all the carbons are in the same spot, right? One, two, three, four carbons in a row. One, two, three, four. So we don't need to do any carbon additions or cleavage. All we need to do is convert this OH group into an alkyne. Well, how do we make alkynes? We only have one reaction that makes alkynes, right? That's an excess sodium amide. And what does our reactant have to be for that reaction? Well, you have to have two bromines there, right? So this first question mark, first when you work from left to right, your first question mark might look like That might be the reactant that we can go directly from there to our final product if we plug in excess Na NH2, because we'll get a double elimination, right? That's the only reaction that we have that makes alkynes is doing a double elimination. And it doesn't matter where the bromines are, they just both need to be you need to have two bromines on there. They could be adjacent or they could be on the same carbon. But since our BR2 addition, our dibromination reaction puts our bromines on adjacent carbons, that's probably going to be the more likely way to, to go. And so then, okay, well, how do we make that? We make a dibromo group by adding bromine to an alkene. Okay. If we have if we're adding if we want to add bromines to an alkene it would be that alkene, right? And I think I added an extra carbon in there somewhere. Pay no attention to that that doesn't change the rest of the problem, right? Um, I miscounted. I made five carbons in a row instead of four. Um, but that just means that we'd be one carbon closer. It's not going to change the reaction sequence. That molecule instead. So then the question is, okay, well then how do we get from an alcohol to that alkene? Well, it doesn't even really matter if which type of elimination it is. Both types of elimination are going to give you that same product because our oxygen starts on the primary carbon. Um, so we use that that reaction step that we learned today that converts the oxygen to a better leaving group, which was written, a reminder, I'll write it out clearly so you can see it, it was TS comma in pyridine. Pyridine is just a solvent. And that converts an oxygen to a good leaving group. And then the second step would just be expose it to strong base. It's so sodium ethoxide and sodium hydroxide. And that's going to give us the elimination product. Right, so working your, your way backwards is usually the best way to approach these because there's only going to be a certain number of reactions that can give you the right product. 
at the end, right? There's there's a million different reactions. I mean, you guys don't know a million reactions for it yet, but there's a, a huge number of different reactions you could do to, if you just start with the starting material. That could go any number of different ways. To make sure it's going the right direction, though, start from where we need it to be as specific as possible, which is the end product. And then move one step further back. Okay, okay well, if I need to be here at the end, how do I get adjacent to that? And then how do I get one step closer and so on, right? It's always going to be this work backwards and this retro, this, and that's what they call a rent, retro synthetic pathway. Right? And so here's the key for those ones. That's what we just worked through. If we want to make it an alkyne at the end, we need to have two bromines, we can do a double elimination. If we want to add two bromines, that means we need an alkene that we can expose to Br2. If we want it to be an alkene, we need our OH to be a good leaving group and then expose it to, um, to a strong base, sodium methoxide. They're using sterically hindered bases instead. It doesn't really matter. You just need a strong base to have it go through that elimination. Let's see. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end the lecture a little bit early, give you guys a few minutes to try this out, and we'll go through the prob the answers at the beginning of lab later today. Um, or the answers are in the textbook as well. I, these are questions that are that they work through as examples in the textbook um, in chapter 11. If you don't have the same edition of the textbook, just go to chapter 11 or the synthesis chapter and you should be able to find these same problems. And we'll go ahead and end there for now and give you guys a few minutes to work on this. Does anybody have any questions before we stop?